We now have a pretty powerful imaging model of the relationship between things in the world and their image. But we're not quite there. There's a few things that the camera obscura or the pinhole model, even with all that generalization, can't describe. Here's one of them, for example. So let me remind you, this is an image we saw in one of the first slides. And remember also that the background here you can see is slightly blurry relative to the foreground. And that is not something that can happen with a pinhole camera. Why not? Remember that the way the pinhole camera works is for every point in the world, there is a single ray that projects through that small aperture and strikes the back of the camera or the photosensitive material. And so there's no mechanism for something to get smeared. Everything should be imaged into perfect focus. And the reason why our current model can't explain this type of phenomenon is that it's not complete. It's close, but not quite there. So let me remind you what the model was again, just in terms of the picture. We have our camera. I'm actually gonna revert back to the, ne the, the negative again because it's gonna make it a little bit easier to describe what's next. So I have the aperture up front, I have the photosensitive material in the back, and again, my optical axis going here. And we're gonna do this in 2D again because the 3D is, is very easy. And the problem, of course, is right here, is this little aperture. There's two problems with it. This is not what a modern camera looks like. It doesn't have this tiny, tiny little aperture through which one single ray of light goes through. There's a couple reasons for that. The most important one is efficiency. When you only allow a tiny amount of light in, you need to have an extremely, extremely bright scene in order to image properly, or you have to have very long exposure in order to allow enough light to come in to properly expose. So modern cameras have replaced that tiny little aperture of just opening a hole and closing it with the miracle of optics, which is the lens. And what the lens does, the lens here in your eye, the lens in a camera, the, the lens in a telescope, collects light from a multitude of directions and focuses that light. And you can draw that in a pretty simple way if you assume a very simple, what's called thin lens model, which is not really the most general possible model for lenses, but it's gonna be good enough for what we need to do. And so here's the idea. I have a point out here again in my world, and that ray that I'm showing you going right through the middle looks awfully familiar. Here's the sensor again. That looks like the perspective projection ray, that single ray, if you imagine taking that lens and just stopping it down until only one ray goes by. But of course, that point out in the world reflects light in all directions. Remember, we have a light source, it hits here, and then light bounces in all directions. And then this lens is capturing uh, a number of those rays, a multitude of them. But then magic happens, which is that it focuses those rays into a single point. And so if that point is up here, for example, instead of down here, well then that central ray does the same thing. And then these rays bend and they bend so that they focus light perfectly. So now we can, we have a couple of things that are working to our advantage. One is we can collect more light so we have more efficiency, but something is going to be interesting is going to happen. Notice that these two points I've drawn are at the same distance relative to the lens or the camera. What happens when the point gets, say, closer? Well, that central ray, nothing really happens. The same thing, it just goes straight through and it, and it images. But these other rays that come through, notice that when they're bending, they're not quite focusing. They're a little bit out of focus. They're gonna be blurry. Why blurry? Well, that point right there, that single tiny point that is, that is reflecting light in all these directions is gonna get smeared out over this little area right here. And if the point is further from where we were before, which is right there, well then it's going to focus too early and then still get smeared out ever so slightly. And this is what is causing that difference in focus for, thing, for me in that picture and for the background, it's caused by this. And now, of course, what we wanna be able to do is quantify this a little bit and come up with some equations to explain what is happening. So let's do that next. So first and foremost, notice that we haven't thrown away the pinhole camera. This really is a generalization in a very nice way. 
So if I take a point out in the world, and now I'm going to revert back to the old model because I don't have to worry about all the coordinate transformations. I just want to do something simple. I have a point out in the world. It is denoted by capital X, capital Z. And it, that center ray that is going through here is going to project to minus F x over z. Same old perspective projection equations. Okay, so that stays exactly the same. Um, it's just that we have to deal now with the case when the point is closer and further, how much is it going to get blurred and why and, 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 and can we quantify that? Okay, so let me define a few things. And unfortunately here, we have to now switch notation, which is an unfortunate fact, but you'll see this in the literature as well. And so I just decided to do it here. So I'm going to define the distance between the point and the front of the camera as Z, same as before along the optical axis. And now I'm going to redefine this distance between the lens and the back of the sensor as D instead of F. And you're gonna see in a little bit why that is. And now the reason I'm doing that is because we are going to now define the focal length of the lens to be little F. So it's no longer the lens to sensor distance, it's the focal length, which has to do with this bending property that you're seeing of the light here. And that is defined as follows. One over F, the focal length of the lens, which defines the bending of the light, is equal to one over Z plus one over D, where D is the lens to sensor distance, okay? All right, now, what is that focal length, by the way? There's actually a really nice geometric interpretation of it. Uh, take a point out here in the world that is the same distance um, up as the height of the lens and draw that. That ray is going to move straight and it's going to bend. And where it crosses the optical axis is defined as the focal length of the lens. Uh, you can do this in the opposite direction, by the way. You can start from here, uh, go straight out bend the light out to the world and where it crosses the optical axis is defined as the focal length. It's, it has to do, as you can see here, with the bending properties of the lens. And so now we need two things to define our camera. The lens to sensor distance D, D for distance of course, and the focal length of the lens which is little f. And it is satisfied by that thin lens equation that you see right there. Now, all of that is to get us to this point right here, which is how blurry will things be when they move in and out of that point where they are in perfect focus that we just saw. And so we've got our thin lens equation here, and here is our equation for the blur radius r, which you can see um, over here. So that point now is being smeared across the sensor with some radius little r. And that is defined as the following. Uh, big R, which is the radius of the lens, how big is the lens, divided by one over F minus one over Z naught. Z naught, of course, is just how far the point is, uh, times the absolute value of one over F minus one over Z naught, that's that same um, thing that you saw in the denominator here, minus one over D. So there's a lot of things going on in this equation. Let's just do a quick sanity check here. What happens if I take the, my radius of my uh, lens and I drive that radius to zero, at the limit as it approaches zero, so that I have a tiny, tiny little pinhole and only a single ray of light goes through. Well, let's look at the equation. The equation says that uh, big R, as that approaches zero, the blur radius also approaches zero, so everything is imaged into perfect focus. So that makes sense. The amount of blur will be proportional to how big your lens or your aperture is at the front of the lens. Good, that makes sense. What's the other thing that we know? We know that when Z is equal to, uh, when Z naught is equal to Z that satisfies that thin lens equation, everything should be in perfect focus. So let's see what happens now. So here, let's look inside the absolute value. Inside the absolute value is one over F minus one over Z naught. But if Z naught is Z satisfying the thin lens equation that you, we see here, well then that term is equal to one over D, one over D minus one over D, of course, is zero, and the blur radius is zero. So now what we see is that the amount of blur in the image is proportional to two things, how big the aperture or lens is, and then how far we move in and out of this perfect plane of focus.
Okay, now we've got almost where we need to be to explain a modern digital camera that we're going to be using in our computer vision systems. And notice something really beautiful here by the introduction of the lens. We didn't have to throw away the perspective camera model. We didn't have to throw away everything we have done with camera obscurers and pinholes. All we had to do was add one extra term, which is how blurry, how much smeared will content be as a function of a certain distance from the camera. And with that, we're now ready to go on to look at some of the other aspects of a modern digital camera.